and welcome to the webinar. My name is Megan Nicholson, and I'm the Director of Marketing at WellBe.me. We're happy you've decided to join us today for Improving the Patient Experience by Creating Therapeutic Relationships with Patients and Families. A few housekeeping details before we get started. This webinar is being recorded, and you should receive a link to the recording and slides tomorrow by email. Please feel free to share this webinar with colleagues who could not attend today. A question and answer session will immediately follow the presentation. If you have a question for our speaker, please type it into the questions box in your GoToWebinar panel on the right side of your screen. Today's webinar is sponsored by WellBe.me, a patient guidance system that helps create a single streamlined patient experience through the entire journey of an acute care episode by creating a continuum of connection between patients, their families, and their providers. Smart checklists are delivered just in time as patients progress through their care plans. The information is always there for reference when needed in case preparation or follow-up instructions are forgotten. This helps reduce patient anxiety and improves their outcomes. Request a free demonstration and respond to the poll on your screen at the end of the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Mary Polaritis is Creative Healthcare Management Vice President and co-author of See Me as a Person. As a co-creator of the Relationship-Based Care series of books and seminars, Mary helps healthcare organizations create a framework for delivering world-class care with strong underlying values and principles, and then works with them to implement that framework. Mary, I'm going to hand the controls to you, and you can take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's lovely to be here with you. I hope you're enjoying this gorgeous September day, wherever you may be. I'm coming from the Midwest, Illinois, and I do have a sunny, lovely day. And um, after the last couple of weeks, it's nothing to take for granted. Um, I'm going to talk with you today about the work that I co-created with uh, Michael Trout a psychologist and director of the Parent Infant Institute in Champaign, Illinois, uh, about how to be in therapeutic relationships with patients and families in our fast-paced healthcare systems. Um, you're going to learn, I think, as we go through this, that uh, while there is not anything new about the therapeutic relationship, it's something most of us are quite familiar with. We've learned about in our uh, foundational education and training. As healthcare has continued to accelerate, it's been much more difficult to keep that front of mind and even more difficult to put into practice. I've been struck by the, the old quote by Charles Dickens that I'm sure is very familiar to you from his book, The Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times and the worst of times the age of wisdom and the age of foolishness, the season of light and the season of darkness. In short, the period was like the present. That was a quote in the mid-1800s, and I think for most of us in healthcare, that resonates for us right now. Never in our history has there been such a profound focus on the patient and family's perception and experience of care. Never. The patient experience is identified as one of the top five key priorities by CEOs. Patient experience teams and patient experiences experience officers have been formed and appointed. There is a really clear and I think universal recognition that high quality clinical uh, care is a minimum expectation. People expect that when they put their hands into our their self into our hands. And that in order to have superior care, it's going to take more. And that is really looking at the relational quality of care. It must be carefully attended to and identified and designed. So in our furor and focus on improving the experience and with the growing emphasis on achieving HCAP targets, 
there's been a variety of approaches and methods being publicized, being enacted, being promoted. Much of it under the umbrella of service excellence. And over the past decade, healthcare workers have been taught the fundamentals of good customer service, introducing themselves, telling patients their role, informing people about what to expect, asking if there's anything more they can do for them before they depart, and following up when they say they will. These are all very important things, very important. And I would say that, you know, if you look at your own experience as a patient, and I've been paying close attention to our local clinics and hospitals, it's very different walking into a clinic or hospital today than it was even five years ago. They're much more responsive. They're much more attentive. There's, it would be un, very unusual for a reception person not to look up and to greet you and to welcome you. So there's been great strides. But I would suggest that it is really just the tip of the iceberg. And while all of these practices are extremely important, they are likely not to represent a big differentiator for patients and families. In fact, people kind of expect civil behaviors and good manners, like introducing ourselves. They will notice when they are missing, but they may not really be surprised when good manners are enacted as part of our care and service. The other thing that I'm really struck with is clinicians are reporting feelings of what I've named metric and monitoring fatigue and our fury to improve the, the experience. There's been a constant uh, push to raise the bar, to say the right thing, to do the right thing, and then people are often frustrated by uh, the results. What I think we need to be looking at, let, at is what's under the tip of the iceberg. And part of our work with relationship-based care is to look at that. What the infrastructure is that supports the relationship, particularly of those clinicians as they interact with patients. Is the culture one in which it, caring and healing are, are front and center? Or is it a culture of transactions and processes and um, productivity as a main focus. Both are important, but what is driving the engine becomes critically important, I think, to the patient experience overall. And then how is team aligned behind a shared vision and shared purpose? And then at the center of all of this is what I believe is authentic and knowledge-based human connection. While customer service methodologies can certainly create the milieu and the environment for more responsive care, it does not get to what we need when we're vulnerable and ill and afraid and putting ourselves in the hands of strangers, physicians, nurses, physical therapists, other clinicians who touch our bodies, who touch our souls, and we need to know that they have our back and that they have some sense and some interest in what it is we're going through as we try to navigate this episode of illness or trauma. So that's what this session is about. I'm going to talk with you a little bit about what it looks like to be an authentic and knowledge-based connection and why that matters. We're going to revisit the purpose and nature of the therapeutic relationship itself. I say revisit because, again, I think many of us have been grounded in that in our, in our basic education, but it's gotten uh, lost, if not marginalized, in the rush of the last couple of decades. And then I'd like to introduce a therapeutic framework that Michael and I hope will support interprofessional practice and enhance authentic connection with patients and their loved ones in time-constrained environments. We have and have always had caregivers, physicians, nurses, therapists, social workers, and many others in, in healthcare who practice in the way I'm going to be describing to you. They are the ones who find the person labeled as demanding interesting. They even may even say, I wonder what he or she is afraid of. 
or I wonder what has shaken their trust in us. They're the ones you know who will engage the grouchy man in 402 and are calm the agitated woman who had everybody on the run on the previous shift. They're the ones that don't seem to take a patient or family member's behavior as a personal affront and instead see it as a symptom of pain or distress and move into their care with genuine curiosity and interest rather than doing the natural thing, which is to want to pull back from such difficult people. They can't genuinely like every person, but it doesn't matter. They treat those who have a personality only a mother could love with the same basic human respect and regard as those who are responsive, even fun to care for, tend to give back, make our job a joy. They are the ones that manage to accomplish their tasks of care without compromising their ability to connect moment to moment with those in their care. It's quite masterful to observe. So this work is really dedicated to those caregivers and an invitation to all of us to demystify what it is that helps them to be such therapeutic uh, instruments of care to demystify it and to begin to support each other in making that level of care more of the norm. So our work is built on something very, very simple and I want to begin with that so that we uh, can hold that front of mind as we go through some of the specifics. People have really very fundamental and very similar needs. They need to be seen, they need to be listened to, and for the moments we're with them, they need to have our undivided attention. It is in those moments that we really convey that we are there, that we have our back, their back, and that we are interested in them. Solid knowledge-based clinical care requires both a mastery of therapeutic connection with people who are suffering, vulnerable, frazzled, and frail, people who look to caregivers as those who will watch over them and keep them safe, as those who will know how to guide and inform and involve them so they can cope and manage their care, and as those who have a sound knowledge of the feel and thus really get, understand, what emotional patterns and upheaval the person needing care and the person's loved ones may be experienced. We know that compassionate care results in improved outcomes. And so the, the significance of this work is uh, obvious. But the research has shown that when we are compassionate present, healing presence, that patients' trust increases, there's a, a bridging of differences, people feel like we're, we're in it together with them, there are improved health outcomes, there are in, increased satisfaction, and really significant research about a better adherence to treatment recommendations because people feel like it has been uh, developed with them rather than to, given to them. And all of this leads significantly to reduced health care expenditures and uh, fewer malpractice claims. So the nature of the therapeutic relationship. Before I go through this, I'm going to read you a st quick story that opens the first chapter in our book. And it's a story uh, told to me by a nurse in Maryland by the name of Maria Bell Chambers. She's the director of the emergency department at Laurel Regional Hospital. And she describes a story from her early days that really uh, became the foundation of her practice. We've entitled the story The Cloak. She said they called the war in Ireland the Troubles. It's funny how people put an acceptable name on an unacceptable situation. In nursing school, my teachers were very clear that we were going to have to deal with the troubles. We had classes where they would discuss what we were going to experience. 
Royal Victoria Hospital would get its share of traumas, burns, and everything but organ transplants. The people involved in the Troubles were as varied as they were rancorous. The British Army, the Ulster Police, the Irish Republican Army, which was Catholic, the Ulster Freedom Fighters, paramilitary splinter groups, and even politicians and clergy. And with that many factions all fighting each other in Belfast, we knew that we would see victims of violence and that some of these victims would very likely have tried their best to hurt people we loved. The hospital was patrolled by army and police officers with machine guns. When I tell that to people, they shudder, but strangely, we felt protected by their presence. Royal Victoria Hospital was a Protestant hospital, so I knew that I would have patients who would curse at me because they would know by my name, Maria, that I was Catholic. It was inevitable that they would abuse me verbally. The teachers knew that, so they prepared us. They taught us about our sacred mission that came down from Florence Nightingale. She took herself into the most dire conditions, and she knew that every patient needed dignity and respect. Our teachers taught us that it was part of our mission that even though the patients may yell at us or curse at us, we would not react or take it as an affront to our personhood. We understood that we would never allow the patient to break through the cloak, as we called it. They wore capes in those days, which was a symbol of the dignity of our profession. Our teachers told us, your dignity, your mission, your values, that's what you bring to the bedside, and you cannot allow anyone to take that away from you. They taught us that we would retain our souls and our mission if we'd not allow the ugliness to break through and touch us. I found that story incredibly compelling because it really represents what I believe is the, the nature of the therapeutic relationship. This is a unique relationship. It is like no other and is built on our decision to become uh, clinicians, caregivers, through licensure, through job description, through our decision and choice to work in a healthcare arena, I think we bought on, we took on the responsibility of engaging in this unique relationship, one in which we offer care, touch, compassion, and presence, and any other act or attitudes that foster healing and expect nothing in return. It is not a two-way relationship. This unique one, in my mind, is one in which our job is to provide care to another. Now, the, the interesting and miraculous part of this is, of course, that when we engage in that relationship, we get miraculous uh, return on our investment. But the, the important thing is that it's not an expectation that we have of the other. And through the intentional use of self, caregivers cultivate emotional safety for their patients and their patients' loved ones. In this unique relationship, we accept people exactly where they are. We actively suspend judgment and remember, like Maria remembered with the cloak, that in this circumstance, I am here to care for you, and nothing you do or say will alter that commitment. I've done a lot of work through the years with um, clinicians, asking them to tell me stories of um, care experiences. And I find it, it, I'll gather a group together that come from a variety of settings in the hospital, cardiovascular, obstetrics, mental health, uh, emergency department, medical surgical areas, and uh, to tell stories of care in, in which they thought they made a difference to their patients. Now, very, very rarely did I get a story that was about, simply about te clinical technical care. It was always about making a difference in the, in the way they touched another human being's life. 
And then we did a content analysis of these stories to look at what human responses were reflected in the stories. And there were a top five that continuously came forward. And when I ask people just openly in an audience, what's, what do you think is the number one human response to illness, trauma, or crisis without hesitation? They all say fear. Of course it is. Fear of the unknown, fear of helplessness, fear of dying, fear of pain. Most people fear death less than they fear continuing pain. Pain can stun us, humble us, stop us. And so that the, the fear of pain is an underlying um, issue for people. And by the way, while some things look routine to us, what I've also learned I, as I've talked to uh, people receiving care and as I've gone through care experiences myself, is that what may be routine to you is simply not to me because it's happening to me. I've used the, the analogy of major and minor surgery. Minor surgery is something that happens to someone else. Major surgery is something that happens to me. So people come in with this human response. Powerlessness, we take away their clothes, we take away their belongings, we take away, they may not be able to, to mobilize, they've had loss associated with um, loss of function and a variety of other things. And of course, all of this then contributes to difficulty coping. I think we need to understand this and understand that all of these are very, um, they're emotions that are represented in the limbic system. When people come to us, they are likely not really functioning from the prefrontal cortex of the brain. They can be, but it doesn't take much to offset that because they're out of their domain and they are concerned about um, coping and, and dealing with their own human responses. So the therapeutic relationship, the purpose of it is, these, is threefold. To help people cope with their circumstance, to help them understand the meaning in their life. It's the only one they will discover, but sometimes simply by being open and listening, they can begin to find their own meaning. And fundamentally, to take ownership to the degree possible for their own healing and well-being. And this may be the individual themselves. This may be the therapeutic way we work with them and their family to, practically speaking, prevent rehospitalization, to prevent unnecessary complications. So the partnership that we engage with as we develop a therapeutic connection is to accomplish these three capacities. We talk about the, re the therapeutic relationship as being the relational component of our practice. All of us have an instrumental domain as well. And that really is distinguished by our unique disciplines. A, phys a physician's instrumental domain of practice is different than a nurse's, which is different than a physical therapist, which is different than an occupational therapist or someone in pastoral care or social service, social work all have a role and responsibility that is attached to an instrumental domain of practice. Where I think we have a shared knowledge base is in the relational realm of practice, understanding the human response to illness, and uh, understanding how to engage them therapeutically. It is through a balance in both the relational and the instrumental realms that curing and healing are possible. And we know that while curing may not always be possible, a healing experience, which I think by definition is the definition of a superior patient care experience, is always possible. Now, what has been intriguing about the relational aspect of our practice is that it's been seen as um, kind of mysterious. There are those who have it and those who don't. There are those who say, I'm just not touchy-feely, that's not my thing, I, you want me to save lives or not. There, there's a variety of um, takes on that little quote. But the, I think the point is, it can be taught and it can be learned. 
and there is a, a field of knowledge that supports it that is every bit as legitimate of the field of knowledge that supports our instrumental practice. So just as it would never be thought acceptable that a clinician would fail to be technically proficient, it can never be thought acceptable that a clinician be permitted to lack relational proficiency. And if we agree to that, then we need to have a, a very clear developmental plan, developmental track that will help people begin to function to their fullest level of uh, relational proficiency. We are offering this methodology as a way uh, to, to support that kind of proficiency. And it really involves what we call four practices. The, the first practice is, is represented on this diagram as the container for the other three. And that is presence through attunement. And then wondering, following, and holding are the um, interactional practices that support uh, the therapeutic relationship. And I'm going to spend a little time on each one. So presence through attunement. Um, I told you that I have partnered with Michael Trout, a psychologist, to develop this work. And he, his um, practice field is infant mental health. And so it makes great sense that he would bring his knowledge and understanding of what it looks like for attunement to take place between a parent and child. And I saw a great, um, I thought that was a great area to compare to what it feels like when we're momentarily dependent as a patient as well. That a child looks to the parent for safety, for sustainment, to, uh, to really kind of pick up the cues, some spoken, many not spoken, that I am okay here. And when we're ill and vulnerable, we uh, fall into some of the same seeking of cues. Is my caregiver there? Will they come back? Are they paying attention? Are they listening to me? Do I matter? So being attuned to another is fundamental to surviving and thriving. Healthy attunement leads to healthy connection and attachment. Misattunement, in contrast, leads to disconnection, a sense of isolation. There's a, there, a science, both a neurobiology and a scientific uh, component to this work. It is really interesting to explore deeper. I don't have, I don't plan to go into that in this session, but it really involves the concept of energy and co-regulation. Simply speaking, what we know is anxiety is contagious and calm is contagious. Clarity and focus is contagious and distraction and um, hyper activity is contagious. So when we think about, let's just think about the hospitalized patient in the bed, the way we enter that room either conveys a sense of safety, I'm here, I see you, I listen to you, you are safe, or it can convey a sense of a distractibility and the, the person begins to feel anxious in our care. Uh, Jill Bolte-Taylor uh, wrote a book called The Stroke of Insight. You've likely heard about Dr. Taylor. She's a neuroanatomist who, while conducting research at Harvard Medical School's Department of Psychiatry, experienced a massive left hemisphere stroke. She was in this unique position of actually observing herself while she was recovering, and her book describes her experience. So with her shift into her right hemisphere, she lost her capacity to speak, and to interact, she lost the left hemisphere, but became incredibly attuned through her right hemisphere. And she says, I became empathic to what others felt. 
Although I could not understand the words they spoke, I could read volumes from their facial expressions and body language. I paid very close attention to how energy dynamics affected me. I realized that some people brought me energy while others took it away. One nurse was very attentive to my needs. I would describe her as an attuned nurse. Was I warm enough? Did I need water? Was I in pain? She made eye contact and was clearly providing me with space, a healing space. I felt safe in her care. A different nurse, who I would describe as misattuned, never made eye talk contact, shuffled her feet as though she were in pain. She brought me a tray with milk and jello, but neglected to realize that my hands and fingers could not open the containers. I wanted to consume something, but she was oblivious to my needs. Needs. She raised her voice when she spoke to me, not realizing that I wasn't deaf. Under the circumstances, her lack of willingness to connect with me scared me. I did not feel safe in her care. So attuning to another is one of the ways we convey safety and presence and uh, care. Here's a little brief assessment. It's interesting that before I go into that, I just want to say that Jill Bolte Taylor said, I was very attuned to body language and nonverbal cues believing that was particularly true for her because she was in her right hemisphere. I would like to propose that that is true, uh, that kind of hypervigilance is true when you're the person in the bed and you are counting on the other to meet your needs and to keep you safe. Uh, there is a hyper attunement, I think, on the part of the individual receiving care. And if you think back to just communications 101, we remember learning that only 7% of communication is received by verbal um, language. And if you, I think that's really important to revisit because most of our training has been about what to say to people. And what is really true is that people are looking at how we be with them. Are we present? Are we calm? Are we open? And are we listening? They're seeking nonverbal cues, tone of voice, and body language trump the words that come out of our mouths. So I think that's really an important thing to just hold in our minds. So here's some, uh, a quick assessment on your own capacity to attune. Do I no notice nonverbal cues? Do I notice or experience the energy in the room? If I walk into a room all chipper and the person in the bed is crying, do I immediately tune into that? or might I uh, miss it in my busyness with tasks? Uh, that's an, a, obviously a dramatic example, but there are more nuanced examples of that that happen a lot. Am I curious and interested in the person in the room? Do I notice the quality of my own connection with the person? And am I genuinely interested in the well-being of the person? Is that driving my presence in the room? Uh, this is displayed another way uh, by some work by Ari Chapman that I thought was particularly um, helpful. He said you can kind of rate yourself on a continuum from a healing presence to robotic presence. Uh, and I see the healing presence as an attuned presence. A split presence coming in being a distracted by tasks and responsibilities. And you know, some of that is reality. But the the the, the consciousness that's really being called from us is to remember, um, always remember that there's a human being attached to the task that's being done and to clear enough space to start there before you go to task. And then the third is a robotic presence where you treat the patient encounter as a transaction. I think that's a more rare um, approach, but it exists. I've experienced it myself as a patient. I think if we really are honest with ourselves, we can see when people are feeling particularly burned out, uh, they begin to see patients as workload rather than as people, and it can become um, a problematic way. I, the other way you can look at that is just contrasting robotic and split as misattunement. 
and the healing presence where you are uh, focused on the other as attuned. So how do you learn to attune? Well, first and foremost is awareness. It's really uh, it's something we're familiar with. I, I use the example of um, the photographs of the parent-child or adult-child interaction, even with the elephants. It was a mother and baby. Uh, that's something we all have in us. We know that. We know what that's like. We know what it feels like when we are interacting. And maybe we know what it feels like in the way we were interacted with. So tapping into what it looks like. I, the other way I'd encourage you to practice attunement awareness is just watch people. I'm a great, uh, I call myself an attunement nerd. I watch people in airports, in restaurants. Are they, are they connecting to each other? Or is one person distracted by their cell phone or looking around at everyone else but the person who's uh, speaking with them? So it's something you can learn as you observe misattunement, and you can learn as you observe the beauty of attunement. I've also seen some amazing attuned examples. And as we get that in our mind's eye, we can become more aware for ourselves is when we're tuning in and are here and when we're not. The other thing that I really encourage you to think about is team awareness around this phenomenon. And are we really cultivating a culture in which the human being, the person, is central to our care. And then how do we support each other in being um, mindful presence and um, using reflection to help us continue to develop in our craft and develop in our knowledge and skill in this arena. The next practice is the practice of wondering. And wondering is um, characterized by curiosity, openness, and acceptance. And I've used this photograph again of a child because I think we can both, all, both, all of us, remember what it felt like to really uh, look at the world through a child's eyes. Those of you who are parents or aunts and uncles or brothers and sisters or grandparents of younger people can see this amazing sense of wonder and openness uh, in their eyes. It's in us all, but it becomes um, compressed or oppressed or suppressed through life and cynicism and some of our own building knowledge. So it's a state of mind that we have to be intentional about. It's a joyful elimination of our own agenda, not knowing. And it's based on the idea that Every person, every patient has something to teach us without which we can really not do our jobs. We bring, to bring a field of knowledge and skill to the patient encounter. The patient brings information about them, about who they are as an individual, what their experiences have been, so that if we stay open to learning about that from them, the care will advance and the care will be enhanced. And we will probably avoid some missteps. Uh, there's a study that's been done in Canada that I, we just posted on our therapeutic relationship website. And I'll tell you more about how to access that site when we're done here. But it was a, a Canadian uh, group worked at strengthening empathy in clinicians. And they ask them to ask their patients this question. What do I need to know about you as a person in order to provide you the best possible care? What do I need to know about you as a person in order to provide you the best possible care? And what they're finding is that empathy is um, improving in the caregivers because what happens is there's a window opened up in which human connection occurs in a different way than it would if we simply go in and let the person know what's in store for them today, what we're doing for them today, and miss that human element. So we're constantly balancing what we bring to the table, our scientific knowledge and skill, with understanding the unique individual before us and how we need to work with them, partner with them, and adapt that skill. So what is it and what isn't it? Wondering is not um, 
interrogating. It's noticing. It's paying attention. It's being curious. Being interested. If you take nothing else away, can, am I interested in this person in front of me? It's inquiring, not simply collecting data. And you know, we're driven by a lot of data collection. So this takes a very mindful presence and action to also be curious and inquire. It's accepting, not judging. And this is a whole realm of awareness that we have to work with because we all judge. We've been trained to judge. And we're grown-ups, we judge. We've been socialized to judge and we've been developed to judge. But recognizing that our judgment can block uh, data, can block information that is really important to the care of the person in front of us. Um, we can begin to practice suspending our judgment, noticing it and letting it go and, and being interested in what we actually can learn. It's about discovering and not assuming and that staying open and not rushing to conclusions. The other takeaway I would love you to um, just hold on to for wondering is remembering that everybody has a backstory. Now, in fast-paced healthcare settings, we may or may not get that backstory. That is not the point. I think when we remember there is one, it helps us to not rush to judgment. It helps us to see a behavior, for example, that may be um, un something that doesn't isn't very pleasing, anger or a quote, um, being on the call light and seeming to need more than the person in the next room and so forth, the kinds of things that can become irritants. If we remember that everybody has a backstory, we can suspend judgment and stay open to what this might be telling us. What is this behavior telling us? What is it a symptom of? What is it that this person is worried about? That might be a question that would come out rather than trying to, quote, manage the behavior. So the next practice is the practice of following. And this is a series of uh, interactions and acts that's devoted to being led and taught by the patient and family. So I said that wondering is a state of mind that sets us up to be curious and interested. Following really puts into action the, uh, the interaction that will help us learn more about this person. Number one skill is listening listening to, respecting, and then taking in and acting on what we learn. That question, what do I need to know about you as a person? When we're given information, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, some of what we've learned is about being uh, recipients of care, as I know many of you are, or patient, or we're a clinician today and tomorrow we could be the patient or the family member of the patient. Our daughter has a um, chronic illness and has been in and out of hospitals since she was 13. She's now 24. So we, we've been in on both sides of the door a great deal. Recently, she, was, um, she has been put back on the kidney transplant list. And what is really telling to us, she just had, I was with her yesterday in a clinic, and the um, pharmacist came to meet with her, as did her surgeon. And they both were extraordinary followers. And they were extraordinary wonders. They began with, first of all, acknowledging, boy, you've been through this a lot. This is, you're, you're, you're seasoned. And she immediately felt seen and respected. And most everything they asked her, well, tell me what your experience with this has been. And here's what we're thinking this time. Tell me what you, what, um, worked for you with XYZ. It was a wonderful thing to witness. It was also, as you can imagine, amazing for me to see my beautiful young um, adult daughter interacting with her care providers in contrast to who she was when she was a 13-year-old adolescent. It was very different and um, their interactions with her needed to be very different and their interactions with me were very different at that time. This time, I was simply someone in the room because she was in charge of her own care. 
and they were taking that in and acting on it. They paying attention and not only to the patient's words. One person said to her, boy, I can see you've got this in hand. It's so much fun to be working with you. And then continually adjusting our next caregiving act to align with what we've learned. So as she's told them, for example, that this particular medication caused these terrible side effects, as they were finishing up, they acknowledged that this medication causes these terrible side effects. So glad she let them know that. While she would still need it post her next transplant, they're going to be planning uh, to transition her in three months. They'll be bringing a team in. They will work with her. And so she was immediately reinforced that her number one concern was being heard and addressed. So she experienced herself not on a production line, but at the hands of people who, gave humane, who give humane and compassionate care. And this brings us to our next uh, practice. I'm, I'm hoping you're seeing right now that these are not steps in a relationship, that these are highly integrated and highly interactive. When we are attuned to the person in front of us, we be, they begin to feel safe and are able to, um, to communicate with us. When we are curious and genuinely interested, they are more inclined to let us know what's on their mind. When we follow what they tell us, that is reinforced and they're even more inclined to partner with us and tell us what is on their mind. And when all of these things are happening, we're holding them in our care. And that's the, the fourth practice. Holding is an act of devotion. It comes from the idea that we want to protect and defend the person to whom we are devoted. And this takes us all the way back to the nature of the therapeutic relationship and the story of the cloak. Devoted to the person in our care is a professional, a sacred trust. It does not mean we necessarily even like the person in our care. It's not about that. We respect them as full human beings and we take seriously the sacred trust we committed to when we identified and took on ourselves the responsibility of being a caregiver. So holding them and protecting them means uh, clearly we keep confidences. We remember what we, they've told us. We remember what we've learned about them. <clears throat> and we uh, integrate that into our care. We speak of and write about the person with dignity and respect. This, this is a simple statement, but it's not easy to do because our cultures are shorthand cultures. We use a great deal of offstage language and labeling and discussing of people that could be seen uh, as um, less than respectful. The question is always, if this person were standing in the room, would I be talking about them in the same way as I am to the next care provider? So this is a very uh, strong ethic and it's not an easy practice. But I think it's a really critical component of the kind of therapeutic care we're talking about. And then being a steady and non-judgmental presence, even the face in the face of strong emotional responses. So we create a safe haven for healing. And this, uh, as I discussed earlier, is not easy, but it really is a simple, fundamental um, foundation for what we mean by humane and compassionate therapeutic care. I've, I've included a little bit on bearing witness to suffering because sometimes what gets in our way of, of being a therapeutic presence is simply not knowing what to do. You witness, you those of you in direct care, witness suffering every day. And sometimes it begins to take a toll on you. So it's really critical that we create caring and healing cultures that help us to support each other in the face of suffering. And to remember that sometimes simply being with a person, simply wit witnessing, is um, a healing practice. That we, can't, we cannot cure everyone. We know that. 
but we can be a healing presence to anyone in our care. So I'm going to do just say a couple more things and then open it up to some questions and thoughts from you. We have this saying, take the time it takes so it takes less time. And this comes from Pat Pirelli, who's actually a, a wild horse trainer. But I think, oh my goodness, does this apply to our settings and our fast-paced environment. When I ask, I do a survey when we do our workshop for our participants in the workshop. And at this point, I must have over 700 responses. And I ask them, what's the most challenging aspect of being in a therapeutic relationship? And chaotic environments and uh, time constraints are always number one. Um, so one of the things Michael and I tried to be very respectful about is this reality and to put together a methodology that would reflect how to be in real time, in moments, with each person in our care. We're not talking about hanging out for 30 minutes, because we know that can't happen, unless it needs to happen. And we talk a little bit in our book about code compassion, um, where a caregiver can say to another, I need to be with Mr. So-and-so for the next 20 minutes. Will you watch over my other patients? We've got a code compassion here. He really needs that kind of invested time. It's, a, it's not the norm. It's outside the norm, but it is absolutely supported because there are high stakes things going on in every unit in hospitals. And there are times that presence and listening and compassionate interaction is critical to the well-being and ongoing success of the care. In moments, we talk about take five uh, or five minutes at the bedside. It can be two to three minutes at the bedside. But undivided attention, remember what the fundamentals of needs, they see me, listen to me, give me your undivided attention, can stop uh, problems down the line. And we don't have time to go through it right now, but I've got many examples, and clinicians give me many examples of how upfront interaction that is focused saves time on the other end. I've already talked about the power of team connection. We cannot do this alone, although we each can interact uh, in ways that are right for us, really to make this an organization-wide uh, reality. We have to be in this together. And then to remember that the root of compassion we, begins with compassion for ourselves. In relationship-based care, we talk about the three critical relationships. And the first relationship is the relationship with ourselves. That's a whole uh, another hour discussion, at least. I can't go uh, into much of that right now, other than remembering that you matter, you're critical, you are the instrument of healing. And because of that, you've got to cultivate practices that um, help you tend to the, the well-being of you. Um, and so I, this is the book, and I put the uh, website, the www.thetherapeuticrelationship.com is a complimentary website that Michael and I have created for you. We invite your questions, those kinds of uh, confounding interactions, and we respond to those on the site. We also post um, new research and literature like, uh, like the Canadian research. And uh, we'll be starting to do more book reviews and that kind of thing to help uh, keep this front of mind and to support you in your practice. And we also offer a therapeutic relationship workshop that I'd be happy to talk more with you about should you be interested. But at this point, I welcome your questions and thoughts. Thank you, Mary, for that inspired presentation. We will now open it up for questions. If you have a question for our speaker, please type it into the questions box in your GoToWebinar panel. Um, while attendees are submitting questions, I wanted to remind everyone that this webinar is sponsored by WellBe.me. A patient guidance system helps create a single streamlined patient experience throughout the entire journey of an acute care episode by creating a continuum of connection between patients, 
their families, and their providers. Spark checklists are delivered just in time as patients progress through their care plan. The information is always there for a reference when needed in case preparation or follow-up instructions are forgotten. This helps reduce patient anxiety and improve their outcomes. To request a free demonstration, respond to the poll on your screen. All right. We have a couple minutes left before the end of the hour. Mary, how would you suggest not being judgmental? What are some tips with people who are difficult to work with? How do you keep that at bay? Well, the, the short answer is uh, cultivating awareness. Being aware of when you're judging, being able to just notice that, not judge yourself, by the way, for judging, because we all judge, but noticing that and then cultivating a practice in which you can suspend that, sometimes a nice deep breath. Uh, and I use almost uh, the image of a cartoon uh, saying above my head, and we'll put the judgment right up there, okay? I am judging that this person is really triggering me because uh, of their behavior. And now that I realize it, I think he reminds me of my brother who used to boss me around a great deal. Okay, let's put that there and now turn back to the person in front of me right now. It's, a, it's an internal mindfulness that can help you uh, suspend it in the moment. The other place you can suspend it is we have, con we have control over what we then choose to convey to somebody else. And while I might have my judgments uh, haunting me, because sometimes they do, I can make the choice to not pass them on to the next caregiver so that uh, that person has the opportunity to meet this, this individual with an open mind and heart. Great. Um, I have a question here in the room at Welby from Lucas. Hi, yes, thanks. I have a question um, mostly from the perspective of healthcare providers. So a lot of research has shown that people really do have a sort of finite amount of willpower every day. And and as, as they're taxed, as their, their patience and attention is taxed throughout the day, they, they have less and less capacity for patients' attention. Um, what are some sort of healthcare specific ways that care providers can, can maybe activities or uh, exercises um, that care providers can do to sort of increase their, their capacity to, to be attentive to Mm -hmm. to, to listen and, and really respect the person because it, you know, I, I certainly see a lot of people who go through a very stressful days and, um, you know, they're, they're people too, so how can they sort of recharge their batteries to give patients the attention they deserve? Well, that's a great question. Um, first, is to start at the level of an individual, uh, we all need to uh, look at ways to cultivate, as I said, a more mindful mindfulness so that we are less likely to get hooked and pulled into uh, someone else's um, someone else's deal. So it's about learning how to be present without getting overly involved. So it, there's a boundary practice there that can be cultivated. Um, and some people do this through actual mindfulness practices. Others may uh, want to get a mentor that will help them with that, somebody that they can say, you know, I am just losing it with this person. Let's, let's help me get perspective here. Having some huddles, you know, we talk about team huddles, and team huddles are often about making sure everybody knows what needs to get done and that they're all on track and so forth, but using huddles for stress release, uh, having um, some humor, some, some uh, some movement, they can do it in a private space, a stretching, yoga uh, move that will just take 20 seconds that can help us move out of the, the intensity. Uh, so physical breaks, mental breaks, and then being able to lean on each other. Uh, some days you're just breathing fumes, that's the truth. And when I am, can I, um, can I be, can I lean on you today? So those are a few tips, there are many more, but those are a few off the top of my head. Great, thanks a lot. 
Our next question is asked, is there a specific or good way to apply what we've learned today in a home care environment? Is there any oh, difference? I, oh, yeah. Absolutely. I love that question. Of course there is. This just translates beautifully into the home. And actually, home care nurses probably are uh, some of our, our experts in this kind of care. Because you're entering somebody else's space, there's a natural, uh, uh, I think, cue to become curious and attuned. You don't know exactly what you're walking into. And so, you know, you're, the, the, it's kind of a reversal of the way it is in a hospital setting where we're in our land and you're, in, you're visiting. In the home, you're visiting in their space. So uh, it absolutely applies, and I think the practices would really support what you're doing beautifully. Great. Well, that's all the time we have for today. If you have questions that you didn't have a chance to ask, please email them to info at wellbe.me, and we will um, connect you with Mary or get back to you. Everybody watch your email tomorrow for a link to the recorded presentation. Thanks, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.